metían a los contrarios vendedores aquí cercanos y los torturaban en este cuarto. Jesus Christ. This kind of being what everybody's starting to clamor after. It's a semi-automatic rifle. Here we have a border patrol vehicle going very fast. One of the reasons so many guns get smuggled from the U.S. into Mexico is because it's easy. There is corruption, como la hay aquí en México, la hay allá. Teresa Sánchez. Si Juárez no tuviera el paso, no tendría violencia. That's still the United States, but now thanks to this private wall, I can't get through. It's just crazy. It is crazy. When you look at them from above, El Paso and Ciudad Juarez look like one big city. And in a sense, they are. Their cultures, their economies, and their people are tangled together in a million different ways. It's almost as if this weren't one of the most contentious borders in the world. Take David Romo. He's a writer and musician who's American, according to his passport, but he grew up back and forth between the US and Mexico. For three generations, from my mother's side, we've had family that have lived both in Juarez and El Paso. So there was this constant crossing back and forth. Here on the border, that's completely normal. Just like the river is constantly shifting, sometimes you're on this side and sometimes you're on that other side. That's just part of our history, this, this idea that we're never really here nor there. And power always feels very anxious about it. So it has to try to tighten the border. It has to define this side is black, this side is white. When we met Romo, he asked us to follow him to a place that he considers special, a monument that marks where the border was first drawn in the mid 1800s. It's one of very few places where you can stand with one foot in Mexico and one in the US. So that right there on the other side of that fence is Mexico. On the U.S. side, there's so much stuff that's been built up to make the border inhospitable over the years that it's very difficult to get to the line itself. The place we're going now is one of the very few places where you can do that. But to get there, you have to get to the other side of a privately built border wall. This private wall was built on private land owned by this random brick company that gave permission to this organization called We Build the Wall. Here we have a border patrol vehicle going very fast. Jesus Christ. Because the American Congress was not apportioning the money necessary for Trump to build the wall, they decided to just fundraise and use private money to start building a barrier around here. Sure enough, we see the wall up ahead, along with something new and unexpected. The wall was recently extended onto government property with a gate that blocks the road leading to the monument. Weird. This is weird. So this wall is brand new. This is private wall. Yeah. Look, you yeah. used to be able to walk all the way to Monument Market number one. And this is just sad. I used to ride my bike here. There wasn't all this barbed wire wasn't here. I can't believe this. I have brought people here for years and years, and now I can't get through. That's still the United States. But now, thanks to this private wall, we can't walk all the way to the, the marker. Bastard. So the border itself is just on the other side of this wall here, basically. Yeah, this part of the street still used to be part of US property. The group behind this wall raised many more millions of dollars than it spent. And later, four people, including former Trump advisor Steve Bannon, were arrested and charged with using the project as a fundraising scam. We reached out to the group but didn't hear back. And Trump later pardoned Bannon. But in any case, these two miles of the wall are very real. I'm honestly confused about how they can 
do that. <laughs> like this is this is a, this is it, a public marker, right? Yeah, it's a public marker. But this guy is shutting everything off. You can see it all the way up here. He even, you know, built like a nice little road so that the the migra, the border patrol, can go up and down, right? And that's part of what it means to be a fronterizo, right? That this barbed wire is not only like a physical thing, it's a mental thing, right? It, it's, it, you have to make a decision, you know, what side you're on. You can't be on both sides. It's fucking crazy. It is crazy. The idea that Mexico is a violent place full of dangerous people and that the border is there to keep them out is a powerful idea. I am very, very thrilled to be here in the great state of Texas. Today, we started a big, beautiful wall right on the Rio Grande. It's also an old idea, much older than Donald Trump. Hello, El Paso. The Border Patrol has 20,000 agents, more than twice as many as there were in 2004. There's a buildup that began under President Bush and that we've continued. Americans tend to obsess over everything that crosses the border in one direction, from south to north. But the border's criminal economy wouldn't work without one key ingredient that goes the other way. Every year, hundreds of thousands of American guns are smuggled illegally into Mexico. America's powerful firearms industry and its permissive gun laws are partly to blame. In Texas alone, there are more than 5,000 stores where anyone with an ID, a credit card, and a reasonably clean criminal record can buy a gun. And those are just the licensed ones. Richard Garcia teaches firearm safety at one of them. So with this one, we'll lock it back to the rear. That way we can actually check to make sure it's unloaded. You want to shoot some? I, no, thank you. <laughs> if I were to come in here looking for a rifle to protect myself and my home, what are you going to show me? Um, this kind of being what everybody's starting to clamor after. It's a semi-automatic rifle, got a safety on it, it's got sights, um, very easy to use and very easy to point, and we also have an extendable buttstock. It's, it's just very user-friendly. You're selling guns to people. Do you ever worry about what they're going to do with them? No. It is at our discretion that we can refuse service to people. If we ever feel that somebody may be trying to buy a gun illegally or purchasing for somebody else, we immediately stop the sale and tell them, I'm sorry, I can't help you. But if somebody decides that they're going to buy a gun legally here and go sell it in Mexico, that's that guy's character. He's going to break the law whether he's doing it with guns. I mean, he might be doing it with drugs, too. Um, I can't control what an individual is going to do. One of the reasons so many guns get smuggled from the US into Mexico is because it's easy. One extremely weird thing about this border is that in one direction, from Mexico into the US, it's one of the most tightly controlled, if not the most tightly controlled borders in the world. In this direction, from the US into Mexico, it's virtually open. If you just go through the nothing to declare lane, you go through as we're going through right now, nobody stops you, nobody asks you anything, perhaps, perhaps you're subjected to a random inspection, but almost certainly not. So if you're a smuggler trying to move things in this direction, north to south, all you really have to do is put it in your car and head on over. In the event that you do get stopped, it helps to have someone on the inside. This woman works for the Mexican government at a border inspection post, but she says she also works smuggling weapons for the Juarez cartel, sometimes hundreds at a time. Las personas allá nomás necesitan un permiso cualquiera y puedes ir a comprar una arma. No, no es tanto requisito como aquí en México. Tiene que estar tu vida en peligro y aún así no te hacen caso, no puedes portarla. Solamente que seas un, un policía. Entonces en Estados Unidos, pues, como quien dice, cualquier gente puede traerlo. Es lo que se mira. Siempre. Cualquier gente puede entrar a una tienda de pistolas sí, y comprar una arma. Y, y a comprar un arma. ¿Y quiénes son esas personas las que cruzan la mercancía? Pues más bien personas que usan drogas, porque son los que más fácil acceden. 
eh, no piensan, no piensan que los van a agarrar o ellos nomás quieren el dinero y hacen las cosas. ¿Usualmente son personas que tienen pasaporte americano? Sí, de Estados Unidos. Son los que lo hacen. In case you think corruption is a uniquely Mexican problem, the whole system wouldn't work without some help from the other side. And the sorts of cross-border relationships that are common here exist in the underworld, too. ¿Y ustedes también tienen personas que trabajan del otro lado, que trabajan sí. para las autoridades sí. estadounidenses? Sí, es mucho dinero. Si hay corrupción, como la hay aquí en México, la hay allá. Yo, yo estoy conectada por parte de mi esposo. Él trabaja de aquel lado. Y él fue el que me, me metió en, en esto. Él trabaja para las autoridades de, de aquel lado, dice. De aquel lado, uh -huh. For over 20 years, there's been a low-intensity war in Ciudad Juárez for control over the border. The city police agreed to show us some of what that looks like, as long as we didn't use their names or show their faces. They say they fear retaliation from the cartels. As rival groups and corrupt officials battle for turf, low-level gang members turn up dead alarmingly often. Usted dijo que nos va a llevar a un lugar donde encuentran tirados. ¿Eso qué quiere decir? Tirados son los cuerpos que localizamos por lo regular a las orillas de la ciudad. Normalmente lo que hacen es este, en la madrugada ir por algún vendedor de droga, contrario, y en la mañana van y los tiran temprano para que amanezcan ahí. ¿Y cada cuánto encuentran tirados? Por lo menos una vez por semana. The police took us to a cartel safe house that just days prior had been the scene of a brutal crime. Chécate aquí en seis. Solo que dejaron la luz prendida. Chequen el 10, 20. Jesus Christ. Metían a los contrarios vendedores aquí cercanos y los torturaban en este cuarto hasta matarlos. Eso es sangre. Los alambres los utilizaban para ahorcarlos. Las paletas decían que se empezaban a doblar para que el alrededor del cuello se, se empezara a quedar sin respiración. Now they're taking us to the place where they found their, their bodies. Se vinieron para acá, lo hicieron entre los matorrales y hicieron el hoyo para aventar tres cuerpos. ¿Y los tres estaban allá adentro? Sí, dos hombres y una mujer. Usted, siendo, un, pues siendo mexicano, siendo oficial mexicano, ¿qué piensa de, de la narrativa que hay en Estados Unidos sobre la violencia mexicana? Los números ahí están, los homicidios ahí están. Esto me queda claro que aquí pues son todo este tema de homicidios por la pelea de, de mandar la droga, pero también existe un control por las ventas allá, que, que son las armas que cruzan y compran aquí los cárteles y los grupos delictivos para cometer todos esos homicidios. ¿Y si hubiera más control del otro lado de la frontera, habría menos crimen acá? Por supuesto, acá? por supuesto, porque todas las armas Le digo, el 90% son de allá. Entonces, todas vienen, este, terminan aquí con, con grupos delictivos, la mayoría utilizándose para, para tantos homicidios que tenemos en la ciudad. One person who knows about violence in Juárez is Gustavo de la Rosa, a lawyer and longtime human rights defender. ¿En qué dirección está la frontera ahorita? Hacia allá, a una milla. 
A una milla de distancia. De... Sí. Muy bien, muy bien. De la Rosa helped expose the Mexican government's role in several murders and disappearances in the drug wars. In response, he received death threats and at one point had to flee the city. Al otro lado de la frontera, en El Paso y en general en Estados Unidos, se habla de este lado de la frontera y en particular de Ciudad Juárez como un lugar peligroso, violento, como una especie de amenaza que debe ser frenada. Acá, ¿cómo se habla de ese lado de la frontera? Nosotros vemos al Paso como el barrio donde viven nuestros familiares que están un poquito, un poquito mejor que nosotros, nada más un poquito porque tienen muchas deudas y muchos, eh, muchos problemas eh, de vida. Eh, son muy aburridos, además. Pero además el otro problema del paso, para nosotros el paso es un problema porque una cantidad muy grande de delincuentes viven en el paso. Si Juárez no tuviera el paso, no tendría violencia. Toda la violencia que se genera en Ciudad Juárez está vinculada con el paso. For years, people have contrasted the violence of Ciudad Juárez with the low crime rates of El Paso to argue that the two cities are somehow fundamentally different. But even that sense of peace was shattered in August of 2019 when El Paso was visited by a distinctly American form of violence. Today is the one year anniversary of the, the mass shooting, the terrorist attack at this Walmart in El Paso. All of these crosses represent each of the people who was killed that day. David Johnson, Luis Juarez, Arturo Benavides, Ivan Filiberto Manzano. The attacker was a white nationalist who, who came here specifically to target people of Mexican descent. He drove over 600 miles to get here, even though in the Dallas area where he lives, there are, there are actually more Hispanic people in Dallas than there are here in El Paso. But he still came here to the border to perpetrate this act of terrorism. Because the border is a symbolically, symbolically important place. After the shooting, it seemed everyone in El Paso knew someone who was affected. David Romo wrote a song about a childhood friend he lost in the attack. In Spanish, Cielo Vista means sky view. On August 3rd, 2019, a man armed with a Romanian AK-47 and a white supremacist manifesto walked into the same shopping strip and massacred 22 fronterizos. And one of the people who lost their lives at Cielo Vista that day was my friend Art Benavides, whom I remember as a good-natured kid who used to talk to me about everything and nothing under the sun. This massacre made me feel like, holy crap, man. It, it brought back all these memories on how naive we were, how innocent we were as kids. That there's somebody in a truck asking you for your citizenship, or when you cross from one light to another, they ask you, you know, who are you, where are you from, that, that barbed wire is normal, that, that all these deaths, you know, all these bodies that crop up are just normal. When we tried to go to the monument marker, we were physically prevented from getting there. Mm -hmm. What was the significance of that experience? for you. And to me, that was such a symbolic place. It's a site of memory and a site of, of uh, what it means to be a, a transnational. So yeah, there was anger that these guys, these Minutemen can come in here and raise funds to fuck up my own land, you know. Now I'm, I'm, I'm treated as a foreigner in my own land. I mean, you say, hell no. 
I'm not going to let that barbed wire fence cut, you know, cut a line right down my middle of the brain. I'm not going to decide one or the other. I'm going to be both. A few days later, we went back to the same place we had tried to visit with Romo. But this time we approached from the Mexican side, where there was no wall to restrict our movement. Once again, we saw families swimming in the river. We also realized that the international boundary here runs just west of the river, meaning they were inadvertently in the US. La línea Internacional, de hecho, está hacia ese lado. O sea, ahorita nosotros estamos parados... En México. No, eso le digo, estamos parados en Estados Unidos. Ah. Sí, señor. It was a small reminder that the border is a messy thing, impossible to define or control completely. Even in this border, which is, you know, probably the most heavily enforced border in the entire world. Drones, cameras, border patrol agents, the amount of resources that are devoted to making sure everybody knows exactly where this border is and never crosses it. Even here, you have these weird, absurd in-between zones where people can cross the border without even knowing it. They can go swimming in another country without even knowing it. 